Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, this is Seema from Ohm. This is Macy from Ohm. And this is Jamila Woods. I'm a singer. <laughs> and we're here today as a band to interrogate Jamila Woods. We're Ms. interrogating Woods. you. I'll cross interrogate you. <laughs> <laughs> At Pitchfork. Um, yeah, so it's exciting to be here. Uh, I've known, this is Seema, I've known Jamila for a long time. We've known each other and all grew up here. Both of us went to high school like a mile away from here. Um, so it's exciting to be here at Pitchfork. Are you excited? I'm really to excited to be my first time performing here. Yeah. And it was awesome to see y'all perform last year. Yeah. I think. Thank you. We'll be yeah. on the same stage again. So Blue stage. Yes. Shout out Blue stage. Shout out. Yeah. And it's always nice too because like... Um, like Chicago, you're a big part of the Chicago representation at the festival this year, which is awesome. And I think it's always really nice to have Chicago performers at the festival. Mm -hmm. So, Macy, do you have any questions to start? Well, I know I know Seema knows you through Chicago Children's Choir. Yeah. Um, and the way that I know you is, is actually, I think, through Nico, because mm -hmm. you were uh, doing a lot of poetry. And so I wanted to ask, when did you first start writing poetry and become interested in the art of words? Mm. Yeah, I, I always loved writing since I was really little. Like I would always, I used to like dictate stories to my mom and like make her write them down before I could really <laughs> write. And then I would just, I loved writing stories. And it wasn't until high school it was like really hard. I, I didn't really... I, I'm from the south side and my high school was my first time spending a lot of time further north and I, it was hard for me to fit in at first and so I actually uh, would just start writing poems like on a Zanga page or like a Deviant yes. Art page. I miss Zanga. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't show them to anyone. It was just kind of a thing for me. Um, and then I accidentally got into this poetry performance poetry program at Gallery 37, which is like an after school program. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to do the singing one, but I didn't get in. They put me in the poetry one. I was really upset. But it turned out being really cool because I had this new way to kind of become empowered through my own writing. And they, were, they really emphasized the importance of telling your own story and appreciating your voice. And I think that ended up helping me as a singer too. Um, yeah. I think it's, uh, I was wondering actually if, if you have sort of like these benchmarks of like performance in your life, because I feel like now I know you as like this really um, kind of like calmly and quietly confident person. Like I think that what's really cool about your personality and definitely like on stage is that it's like this real like calm confidence. It's not mm. over, it's not in your face. It's like kind of this very intriguing thing and I'm wondering where you feel like if there were different moments in your life where that kind of solidified for you in your experience in your performance in yeah I don't know just your 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 thoughts about your own you know um personality or mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah think. no I totally I like that question I think um when because when you think of spoken word poetry or slam poetry especially like when you see representations of that, it's like, <laughs> you are screaming into the microphone <laughs> talking like that. And it's like, there's a very like clear idea of what that is. And I remember uh, I had a, a mentor in that after school program who kind of heard me kind of starting to adapt a cadence like that. And it was, we were practicing for Louder Than a Bomb Poetry Festival that now I help organize, but at the time it was my first time doing it. And she literally, we were practicing in her kitchen and she made me stop my poem and she was like, start over. That's not your voice. Start over. And eventually I just started crying because I was like, it sounds kind of more traumatic, but it was actually like a very useful experience because it was just teaching me like I don't have to adopt this other thing in order for it to be a poem or a good poem. Um, and then later on, I, another one of my mentors was like, oh, it's really cool. Like you don't, you, you don't sound like anyone else. And I think um, it's it's cool how you're, and, and that hearing that from like a mentor made, made me feel more affirmed in that. And I think uh, it carried over to, to singing um, because I don't really have a very 
naturally loud voice. Mm -hmm. Like I'm still, I, I still practice, you know, wanting to be better at belting or wanting to be better mm -hmm. at doing runs and all these things. But I think through poetry, I learned that I don't have to only focus on that, mm -hmm. but I can also focus on owning what I already do yeah. really well. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that I love about your voice is that you sound so intentional when you sing, every word that you sing. Like, I think a lot of people, like, they the words that they sing, they sing really loudly and that's what makes them sound confident or makes them sound like they make sense as lyrics. But I feel like that's totally not your style. You go the opposite way where things are very quiet, but you always sound like you're not unsure of why this word is placed here. Right, it's is, like every word is important and every word is placed in that space for a reason, mm -hmm. which is like, I think that's just a really special way to write songs and it's hard to do and it's hard to do and make it sound easy, which I think you do very well. Thank you. <laughs> that reminds me of like my favorite poet is Lucille Clifton, one of my favorite poets. And she's mm -hmm. like economy of words, that way right. that every word has so much weight and Mm -hmm. intention behind it yeah <laughs> the placement how do um, you all think about writing lyrics when you when you're writing because I I remember even before Om listening to your music and there's this uh -huh. one song you have called squeeze and uh -huh. it's just like grab so, reality by the balls and squeeze <laughs> economy of words <laughs> I was 15 <laughs> but I, I know, I know what you're bringing. Um, well at the time I was 15 and I was like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like you know just like the spunkiness of that I just love I don't know oh. so it's just like how do you think about that yeah I mean I think when when I write sometimes there's like a line that I think I definitely like think of lines that like f like run off my tongue really well and then I grab onto that and sometimes build a song around that um like I have another uh and and sometimes it's kind of more about the like how the words sound like I remember when I was in in college I I kind of struggled with poetry for a while it was it was it was mm -hmm. difficult for me to figure out how I felt about poetry especially more contemporary and avant-garde poetry yeah. like um, you know, no rhyme schemes and, 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 uh, and I, and I, and I remember that, uh, I, she, she was sort of telling me that it's, re you have to really pull yourself away from, from meaning all the time and think about how it's shaping in, in your mouth. Mm. And so I, I write that way a lot. Like sometimes I'm like this shape of sound, this shape of word needs to be here. I don't know why, but it feels right. And that's going to dictate how the whole song builds out from that one sound, that one syllable, mm. um, you know, or that one string of like, ta -ta 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 -ta, you know, like, mm -hmm. because those all need to go. Like I have one song where the, 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 this is like my solo stuff, but it goes, and maybe I'll tattoo it on the back of my hand. Yeah. Cause like I just, the ta -ta -ta -ta, I wanted all of those syllables next to each other. So it, it kind of varies, but. Yeah, something, I, I feel like I'm lucky cause I get to see a lot of your songs, particularly in mm -hmm. the nascent stages. And um, it's, it's really awesome because the way, from what I can see, the way that you write, you, you sing a lot of the melodies in shapes of words, but it's gibberish until, mm -hmm. you know, until like the very last point. It's because you're looking for, you know, this this right shape to make with your mm -hmm. mouth and like the mm -hmm. right sounds, like which is puzzling almost like yeah. to find the words to fit the sound that you want. Yeah. Right. And I, I really admire that. It's it's cool. I, I feel like when I when I write my songs, a lot of the time I'm trying to go for that as well. Mm -hmm. But I think I think I'm still working at it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I guess when I'm when I'm writing words, I um I like to I like a lot of alliteration um and I like to talk around points a lot mm. and lately I'm trying to break out of that and trying to be a little bit more literal with mm. the things that I write, but um I really like writing about more abstract thoughts rather than, you know, like this specific thing happened and then that made me feel this way and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, I like, I like writing around the meeting. I like having that challenge to mm -hmm. do that. But I feel like, um, I feel like in a lot of your music, you're, and I, I and I'm curious to how you feel about this, but, um, you know, you're really writing anthems for, for voices that have been 
Um, and, I, and I don't think that you write them as anthems per se, um, even though um, uh, Black Girl Magic or, um, was, you know, I think definitely giving, you know, giving a song to, to you know, a, a group of people whose voice has always been, um, you know, pushed to the back. And mm -hmm. so I think I, I wanted to know, um, I, you know, you also have like a lot of little siblings and I just wanted to, to, to know about like how that influenced and kind of like raising up younger people has influenced your songwriting because, you know, you have YCA. I know you have mm -hmm. a lot of younger siblings that are a big part of your life. And, um, and yeah, how you feel about that role of sort of this, this, this role model and how you are, yeah. Yeah. Going into that. I think um, definitely, again, like coming from not just poetry, but like a poetry community, like mm -hmm. really taught me in writing like the importance of specificity and not to be afraid, like to be super specific um, because it's that that's actually what opens up the possibility for universal, you know, people to be able to relate to it. Because mm -hmm. even if I'm talking about like, 101st and Western, that could make someone think of, you know, the intersection where they grew up. Like it doesn't have to be, it's not, it's not excluding anyone to be specific. Um, and I also think that um, as a teaching artist and as a, a big sister, it's always, especially as a big sister, like, you, you know, you, you kind of have We're this all big mindset. Sisters here. <laughs> well, that's true. We yeah. are. We're all the sisters. oldest sisters. You grow up kind of, you can never just think about yourself. And sometimes that's really annoying when you're like a teenager, but it's kind of a nice responsibility. And mm -hmm. I think that um, similarly as a teaching artist and as a person that I know people, people look up to me, but also in those relationships and those sisterhoods that I have with younger students or my siblings, I learn so much. So mm -hmm. I almost feel like as I'm, as I'm writing, I love sampling and I love showing my influences. And I feel like my siblings and my students are a major, major influence in my work. And um, one of the, my favorite parts about my album was the, the voicemail skits that connect the songs mm -hmm. because I just, reached out to um, some friends and a lot of students and my sisters and asked them to answer these questions to me through voicemail. Because um, mm -hmm. I do feel also like uh, I was having a conversation about group text yesterday and just how important it is, especially now, like you can't always be with your sister or your best friend, but to have these, like a voicemail or like a text that can mm -hmm. really just provide so much, I don't know, comfort in a moment. You still have a space a in yeah. which you can interact yeah. with people yeah. who may be far away. Exactly. And so, yeah, I think that that's just one example. Like even that process happened kind of in the late middle and it helped me finish the album. It wasn't just like, oh, let me just tack on like these voices from other people. It was like an integral part of the process mm -hmm. of making it. Yeah. yeah. You've got like some really good friends. Thank you. <laughs> like, how do you feel about Fatih? This moment friends. where you and Fatih <laughs> are like, you know, like... So amazing. Fati Doing is such amazing. great things. Fatima Asker. Yeah. Um, she, she wrote a web series called Brown Girls. It was about um, maybe a little over a year, but she was, you know, she's a poet and she was like, I want to try to write a web series. I'm going to challenge myself to write it and get it produced by the end of the year. And she did it and now it's Emmy nominated. That's Brown Girls. unbelievable. So I know I saw that the other day and I was like screaming to myself in my house. And you and Ayana were collaborated on some of the music for it, right? We we didn't work on Brown Girls, but um, Ayana worked on the album on right. Bubbles. I worked with a singer called Lisa Mishra oh, yeah. to write right, um, the the theme song for Brown Girls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do oh no! Did you and Ayana just collaborate with Manual Cinema? Was that yes, what it was? Me and Ayana are writing. Um, a the music for a production about the life of Gwendolyn Brooks, which is so coming incredible. out. That's so awesome, November. especially with Manual Cinema. That's gonna yeah. be Manual really Cinema. Badass. They combine shadow puppetry mm -hmm. with film with live acting. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a show of theirs in person, so this will be my first it's one. It's incredible. Yeah. It's really incredible. That's yeah, awesome. that's really exciting. Speaking of the Fati, you know how she kind of manifested that thing. Do you feel like you all have moments where there's something that you accomplish that you feel like 
you maybe, you know, tried something new and weren't sure if it was going to work out? Or like, do you still have those things that you're maybe trying to work towards those kind of like out of the box? I guess dreams? like the last, it wasn't on that huge of a scale. Um, but the last thing where I tried something that maybe was not going to work out, but ended up being great. Um, I, Seema was actually supposed to play this gig, but she had to go out of town and it was for um, a free jazz improvised trio <laughs> at mm. Constellation. And I'd never tried just improvising in front of people before. Um, and I always hung around jazz musicians in high school and like really badly wanted to do that. And it just did not compute with the way that my brain worked. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to give this a try. I'm going to play, I'll play my violin and just see what happens if I just play. Um, and it ended up being one of the coolest things ever because now I do a whole bunch of free jazz and weird You're improvisational really good music. It. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Make weird noises and I get to do it now like out on the road too. So th I guess that was like the last thing that I didn't expect would work out, but did. Yeah. Do you, you on the road with Ohm? Do you use the violin? On the road with Ohm, but also um, with my trio, The Few. Oh, yeah. Um, which is just like, uh, I play violin and improvise with my voice. And then there's an upright bassist, Charlie Kirchen, and Steve Marquette plays guitar. Awesome. That's yeah. so cool. It's good to take risks and like try things out. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure it felt that way when you first started working on solo music. It was you and a vocoder, right? That's how you yeah, wrote a lot of the Yeah, you were early. there. Were yeah. you there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was at Constellation, which is so interesting because I know that place means so much to how you as a band yeah. got started. Trying out new things. There. Was that yeah. for her series? Was that for, yeah. Yeah, it was for it was. her voice? <laughs> of course. I don't. And I just thought about that day the other day. Yeah, that was before I had any really music. It was uh -huh. just stuff on a voice live that I've been playing with. I That's still cool. love that that video of you in the basement with the blue light, just the a cappella. Yeah. That was awesome. I don't know if you if you love it. You know, sometimes I, there's just, <laughs> sometimes do. there's old videos of me and I'm like, nah, nah, I can no, no, so no, I wish I could like scour away. YouTube sometimes. Yeah. Not that one. I like that one. Good. Yeah. Um yeah, but uh when you are when are you do you still primarily compose like with a vocoder or in vocals or um yeah. I I haven't in a while. I've been more working with producers uh -huh. um, since I guess I got in the habit of that with working on the album. But I want to definitely go back to that. And I also want to get better at producing my own mm -hmm. stuff. Because a couple of times, like, you know, I can do like novice things on GarageBand. Like if I hear mm -hmm. a beat that I like, I can like cut it and like start to sing over it. But I, I miss a little bit. This comes from, I guess, choir and like my acapella background of just starting mm -hmm. with just voice is really right. cool. Yeah, I mm. wanted I wanted to ask how you start your songs. Like what what's the first thing that happens when you start to write a song? I know it's not always consistent, but yeah. I really like um, finding I don't know, like it's like a nugget of like a story or like a question that I have. And I I think the other day there was a a friend of mine um, one of our mentors, I think my friend posted something about a breakup and our mentor posted um, the song 50 Ways to Lose Your Lover or Leave Your Lover. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, I love the moment of like her using that song to comfort her and like what the song was talking about and what she was talking about. And I love the drum beat that comes in right at the beginning of that song. So like I want to make, I don't know what the song will be, but I just love like that whole backdrop, even if the story, the song I write won't be a love song, it could be something else, but I like having layers to it, if that mm. makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I have, like, I like making prompts for myself too. I think that helps me a lot. Um, I like, right now I'm trying to write a song, like different songs inspired by my heroes. Um, so I have like a song called Frida that's about how I love how Frida Kahlo and Diego like lived in separate houses with a bridge connected it like that's relationship goals to me so I just wrote yeah. a song about how like yeah I need my space but I love you but like stay over there you yeah. know so like that's what that song's about um, I just I just went to Casa Azul <laughs> oh, in Mexico awesome. City and it's incredible her her whole art working space and yeah she really had like her thing I'm working over here yeah down you know and that's awesome. amazing 
I mean, she was so supportive of him, you know, but mm-hmm. she was... She the was better her artist. Own oh, absolutely. Yeah, way better. I mean, he's amazing. Diego Rivera is incredible. So. Yeah, no shots, but... Yeah, but like, no shots. Better. We all know. <laughs> <laughs> what about you all? How do you start, especially collaborative songwriting? Who starts? Um, That's a good question. I think I think with Ohm, because we because it's a collaborative project, and, um, and I think both of us are... are Mm. We we start a lot more with with improvisation together and some of the songs where it's like the idea is that we want to experiment with this um this sound. Mm. We're like let's play around with the sound and see if it if something if some song comes to us. So, um you know, rather than some some of the songs still, you know, kind of start with an idea and a thread that goes and then we, you know, chords and etc cetera, etc, cetera, but but also some of them are really kind of about capturing like a raw moment together. Yeah, I think a good example of that, we have this song called Water that we, um, like I think a couple nights before we had played um, a show opening for Arto Lindsay, who is this no wave guitarist um, mm-hmm. and singer. And he like plays this guitar that's tuned totally just not <laughs> it's like it's like all the way untuned and it's a it's a 12 string and he just plays these crazy rhythms and then sings beautiful like brazilian melodies over top very of it softly very softly while his guitar is so entirely the opposite of what mm-hmm. his voice is doing and it was so incredible just this dichotomy of this insanity Cards. and then this beauty like floating gently on top of it and so a couple days later, we had a rehearsal and we were like, I kind of like how that sounds. Like, <laughs> let's see what happens if we try it. And of course, it's going to sound way different because we're not him. Mm-hmm. Um, and this song, Water, was born out of it because we were like, we wanted to see what would happen if we just had really disgusting guitars and then like pretty consistent vocals on top of it. So that was I how that, that one started. That's cool. Contrast. Um, I have a question. Where do you think the best tacos in Chicago are? Ooh. I don't even know if I have an answer for that. I don't think I have an answer anymore either. Like, where would you go if you just needed to? Or other food? There's, like, the cheapest best, you know? Like, where you feel really, like, proud of, like, how much you could just eat. Yeah, and then, you know, you have a whole other list for, like, bougie tacos. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, whatever, bougie tacos. I, I like... Coyotes and Pilsen mm-hmm. because they have, I like how they, they don't cut the chicken up. Like it's just like a kind of like f- thin filet of chicken in there. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I just like how they cut the meat there. I like cubed chicken. Is that weird? No, that is that's weird. Fair. Okay. Cubes. Yeah. Yeah. Do like you. a serious cube yeah. of it. <laughs> what um, about you? What are your favorite tacos? Man, is it, I think it's called Urupan. That might not be it. I can't remember. Urupan. It's in. Isn't that the place with all the the, the poor carnitas? Yes. Oh. <laughs> in is that, in, that is it. Up north. No, it's Logan. in Pilsen. Pilsen. Um, and you basically just order carnitas by the oh. pound, and then they like bring you a plate of like meat, and then all the other stuff that tacos are. That's and awesome. And you just like make it yourself. They have the little pickles and like it's so good. I'll try it. Um. I have another question. What has surprised you? So you've been out on the road a lot more recently um, Mm -hmm. and with your incredible, beautiful album, which I love so much. Um, What has surprised you the most about like being out on the road? Um, Who are you usually traveling with? I usually travel with my band. Bless you. (laughs) Um, It's a a four piece band and my manager. Now we have a tour manager. So next week I'll see what that's like and my manager won't have to drive everywhere um but yeah I think one thing is just stamina just like knowing that I have to be really more disciplined when I have a show like maybe like three or four shows like in a row wanting to make sure I sleep and like you know just eat well and stuff like that and then also like how you can still be like really lonely even when you're traveling with like a bunch of people um So I was trying to think of like, like I thought of maybe bringing my sister. It's not quite like I don't have quite enough 
resources yet, but like ideally I want to maybe bring someone who's just like there to just hang out with me. Um, <laughs> Cause I know everyone like, you want to just kind of like be by yourself a lot of times, like when yeah. you get to the hotel or Airbnb or whatever, just like, and that makes sense. But then sometimes that's when like, you can get a little stir crazy too. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's it's easy to get stuck in your head on the road. Mm-hmm. Me and Macy spoon most nights on the road. It's Dude, true. That's that amazing. I just, yeah, I just so. need a spoon partner yeah. for the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sisters are good for that. Big spoon, yeah. little spoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, and, well, what was your favorite, I don't know, we were in choir together. What was your favorite song to sing in choir? Hmm. Ooh. Um, sleep. Yeah, is that what it's called? Eric Whitaker. Yeah. Yeah. Sleep. Yeah, because also, I like discovered a cousin through choir, and Philip would always sing. Or I remember when Philip would sing that solo, uh-huh. and it was around the time that I found out he was my cousin. I was just like, oh, that's cool. Philip is your cousin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? And I have like hidden cousins. I'll just like figure out that's someone's crazy. my cousin. I, I think I have five. five. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Can't imagine but I love hidden ones. Too. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. I like that song because it has like three different alto parts and mm-hmm. alto parts are, you know. Oh, yeah. it's you were an alto, right? Yeah, alto I was one. an alto one. Yeah. We were both alto ones because yeah. I listened it's to you. the better part. <laughs> it's the better it's part. It's very like To droney. be choir nerdy. Um, yeah. Well, um, let me see if I have some other questions. I wanted to ask you about if you had like your favorite book when you were a preteen and when you were a teenager and when you were in college that you were like, Mm. this is my new favorite book. This is changing. Mm. I mean, I know that you're very focused on poetry, but um, I know that you also studied, um, I think, African-American literature Mm -hmm. and um, theater. Yeah. In college. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, In, you said high school or like Mm. when I was younger. Yeah, like preteen. I like this book called What Happened to Lonnie Garver. I don't know. no, mm. or, And I like Speak also by Lori mm. Halls Anderson. It's just like both kind of books about this adolescent like not really fitting in. And What Happened to Lonnie Garver, there's like a, a floating angel character, which basically is just like this best friend who's kind of androgynous and probably queer. Like nothing in the book at that time like used that language. But it mm. was like, I think a lot about just being different and... Um, like two different people finding each other, mm-hmm. um, which I I think I related to because I just felt really different in high school. And mm-hmm. I did always have, I always had like one best friend like throughout all of school and it would kind of rotate who it was, but we were both kind of just like odd and found each other. So I liked, I liked that. Um, I really loved Sula in college um, and Song of Solomon, both oh. Toni Morrison books. Um, and Song of Solomon is really how I learned about the myth of the flying Africans, which is Mm -hmm. like this myth about enslaved people who, um, different versions of it, either they like, you know, jump off the boat and like fly back to Africa or like they sometimes like they walk into the water off the coast and then like build an underwater community like under the ocean that still exists. You know, it's all these like kind of Afrofuturist myths that that really made me research and that's like a large part of what like heaven the song is about like that idea of like dancing underwater like where our ancestors are and Mm -hmm. that kind of black love how it was back then so was that a visual reference in holy too like when you're like lifting Mm. off of the ground I didn't think of that your hair is like lifting maybe so maybe like subconsciously Subconsciously. yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) it's really really beautiful what kind of books did did you all read when you were coming up that were pivotal. I think Preteen Star Girl by Jerry Spinelli yeah. was one of my like favorite books. Like it was right around 13, I remember. Mm-hmm. And it was like that it's cool to be the weirdo. Yeah. Like that you get get confident if you're like the the weird one that mm-hmm. wears a bow tie or something. Um, I really loved that book. And what? The weird one that wears a bow tie or something. I like that. Bow ties have their moment. I love bow ties. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, like, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that was and, a great book. And then, um, yeah. I don't know. And then I th- I think my, then I'm sure there were ones in high school too. Though I feel like I 
was kind of a bad reader in high school because you're always like half reading books in high school. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I spark noted more than I should have in high I know, school. I feel like I only yeah. recently went back to all the books that I was assigned and like read through them. I was like, why didn't I read this before? <laughs> I should have done this. Because <laughs> they're amazing books. Like um, I recently reread Sula, which mm. I think I was assigned to read in eighth grade or something. And it that book is just so beautiful. And so lyrically written but I think I think my favorite book that I read in the last like 10 years was 100 Years of Solitude Mm. I think that one that was pretty it made a big impression on me yeah Uh, Parable of the Sour Octavia Butler that one also oh I have to read that it's incredible very into dystopian novels right now um, and yeah, that one, I think that's the best one that I've read. It's like a that. utopian, dystopian, like things could be better h, later. So, it's awesome. um, but Octavia Butler is amazing. So She's yeah, so she yeah. is. I read one of her books, I think is like xenophobia or something like that. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, I yeah. just remember reading it. I was really young. Like, this is crazy that there's a black woman in the future. Like, yeah, sci-fi. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are most of my questions. Yeah? Okay. Great. Are there any other? Well, thank you, Jamila. Um, Thank you, Siwa and Mason. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Yeah. We're really excited for your show tomorrow. And congrats on the Talia Hall show. It looked incredible. And I hope that we get to see you again at Talia Hall sometime soon. I hope so, too. Because you really looked um, divine. Like you were connecting with something higher. So... I'm really excited to see that tomorrow. Thank you, Seema. Thank you, guys. Yeah.